I'm going to assume that's a yes. So, uh, so I, I wanted to thank uh, Wojciech and Radu uh, for uh, the invitation to give this talk. Uh, also want to thank the Norbert Wiener Center for uh, allowing me to visit uh, for this semester, even though my uh, visiting has been a little sporadic uh, for various reasons. But, uh, and also particularly want to thank John Benedetto for um, uh, arranging the uh, the visits um, in the in the spring and summer uh, of 2021. Uh, what I want to uh, talk about is uh, joint work with uh, my former PhD student Shauna Rave. Uh, you know, at GMU, while she got her PhD, now works for Novetta, uh, the company in Northern Virginia, and also Gerd Sander uh, from Eichstätt, whom uh, whom many of you know. Uh, okay. There we go. Hang on. There we go. So, uh, so here's the uh, outline for my talk. So, the talk is about uh, re-species of exponentials. Um, so, I'll I'll start with a few remarks, a general remarks about re-species of exponentials, and uh, and state some of the uh, um, problems there. Um, then, I want to talk about something called basis extraction and complementation. Uh, which forms kind of the context of uh, of these results. Then I'll uh, go over the main results that uh, that we got, and then uh, basically the rest of the talk is um, uh, about the proof of the main results. Uh, the 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 proof uh, we think anyway is is fairly interesting because it brings together uh, concepts from uh, different areas of mathematics. So uh, so here I though I didn't write it. This uses the um, uh, Vial equidistribution theorem, the Vail the Vail Kinchin theorem on equidistribution, uh, which you use to extract a basis. Uh, then there's a um, uh, a result from number theory, uh, very beautiful result, really. Uh, that uh, um, I'm not sure a lot of people are aware of, but it's very cool. Called uh, about related to what are called Beatty Frankel sequences, and um, and then uh, there's also the main uh, tool here, the main hammer that uh, makes all this go through is uh, Abdonin's theorem on um, uh, perturbations of exponential bases. And that uh, we will um, uh, introduce a, an idea of uh, a calculus of Abdonin maps, which will allow us to, um, uh, to prove our theorem for, for more than just two intervals. So uh, uh, re-spaces of exponential. So, uh, given a countable set in RD, we define uh, E of lambda to be this uh, exponential system. Uh, and just to begin a talk with something that literally everybody knows, uh, if lambda is the integer lattice, then E lambda is an orthonormal basis for L2 of the of the unit Q in um, in RD. And of course, we can expand any function in it. Uh, in its Fourier series, like so. Uh, we will be, for this talk, we'll be working in one dimension, <clears throat> and uh, we'll uh, be looking at the following uh, really trivial variant of the um, uh, of, of that uh, of the result about orthogonal um, bases. Uh, so, if we take a, um, a shift and a dilation of the integers, then uh, the corresponding steps. Uh, is an orthogonal basis for L2 of i, where i is any interval with length a. So this is um, sort of a, a theme when I talk about a um, system of exponentials being an orthogonal basis or reef basis or whatever, for L2 of an interval, what's really important is the length of the interval, because uh, if, if uh, such a set is a basis for one interval, it'll be a basis for any other interval with the same length. Okay, so really we're we're thinking in terms of the length of the interval rather than the the interval itself. Uh, so um, a fundamental question about uh, orthogonal bases of exponentials is the following. So if we're given a domain in R D, can we find uh, an uh, orthonormal basis or orthogonal basis for L two of that domain? And this is a uh, 
closely related to, um, many of us know, closely related to a, a conjecture of Pugleta, uh, who tied the existence of uh, orthogonal bases for L2 of a domain to uh, whether that domain forms a tile, uh, uh, whether it tiles RD. Okay, and by tiles, I just mean shifts of uh, omega by elements of lambda, um, actually partition RD. So the union has to be all of RD and they're essentially disjoint. Okay, so, um, so this uh, um, uh, conjecture has, uh, um, is still not completely solved, but it's gone through lots of, the, the tremendous amount of progress has been made. Uh, so he, uh, Fuglata proved that the conjecture held for uh, when omega was a fundamental domain of a lattice. So if our um, uh, sampling set is a lattice, then that's true. The conjecture is, uh, has been proved false for uh, in dimensions five and higher by tau, uh, also in dimensions uh, three and four by the authors uh, listed here. And it remains unsolved in full generality in uh, dimensions one and two. Um, however, a, a very recent result uh, that uh, gives a, a good uh, sense of when these things exist is the following. Uh, if omega is a convex body in RD, then the conjecture holds in all dimensions. So, um, so this um, sort of uh, takes care of a lot of very natural domains. Uh, in the sense of showing that these natural domains do not uh, admit a um, orthogonal basis of exponentials. So for example, triangles or um, uh, polygons, you know, more than six sides. Uh, polygons don't work in the plane. Polytopes in RD, in general anyway, will not uh, admit um, uh, uh, orthogonal bases of exponentials. So um, that uh, leads us to look at, to, to loosen the concept of an orthogonal basis of exponentials and move to the notion of a, of a Reese basis, which again is something that um, I believe is familiar to, to many of you, but here are the are two definitions. Uh, so Reese basis for a Hilbert space is the image, is the image of an orthonormal basis under a bounded invertible operator. Uh, and uh, that, um, uh, you know, a characterization of Reese spaces is uh, given by uh, this uh, uh, this inequality. So um, a this is true. It's not just of exponentials, but of any any set. So a set of exponentials is a Reese basis for L two of omega if and only if it's complete. In other words, its span is dense, and if uh, this inequality is satisfied. Now, for Reese spaces, we also have a Fourier series type expansion. Reese spaces are minimal, so they have a biorthogonal um, sequence. And if we use that to form the coefficients, then we get a, uh, an expansion result. So the, um, the basic, um, uh, I, I guess, this is sort of the very first step you take in going from a, a Reese basis to I'm sorry, an orthonormal, orthonormal or orthogonal basis to a Reese basis in, um, you know, uh, from the standpoint of complex exponentials is, is the Kadesh theorem. And um, I'm going to state it here. So again, this is a very familiar result. I'm going to state it here um, in, a, in a form that we'll uh, use in the remainder of the talk, so slightly different than it's uh, usually stated. So if we uh, think of a map phi from this uh, shifted and dilated um, lattice, the integer lattice into the real numbers, then uh, the range of phi is a Reese basis for L2 of i for any interval i of length a, if, uh, if this is true. So basically if we think of a being one, then uh, it says that we can perturb um, uh, frequency frequencies that are on the integers or on the shift of the integers by one fourth, by uh, something strictly less than one fourth, and we still have a, a Reese basis. So of course, if we uh, dilate the interval, then we dilate the, the constant here um, correspondingly. 
but uh, basically says a, a, a perturbation of um, of a lattice by less than one fourth of the uh, um, you know width between excessive elements of the lattice will give us a reef base. So, uh, so we can ask the same questions about reef spaces that we asked about orthogonal spaces. So, if we're given a domain, does there exist a, a reef basis of exponential for L2 of that domain? So, um, and this is a area there. There's there's quite a bit of activity in uh, in this area of various kinds, but um, there is no uh, omega for which a reef such a reef basis is known not to exist. Um, but the, uh, in relatively few cases, is it known how to actually construct such space? So a, um, a recent result that, uh, a, a, a breakthrough results from 2015 by Cosma and Nitsan, uh, solved a longstanding problem that showed that there exists that, that if uh, we're given a disjoint collection of subintervals of zero one, then there exists a reef basis of exponentials for L2 of the union of those intervals. And in fact, that reef basis can be chosen to be a subset of the integers. Um, so uh, in the introduction to their paper, the, the authors, um, recount an imaginary conversation with a graduate student, say a naive graduate student, um, it's maybe not so naive, uh, sort of makes sense. Say, well, wh why is this such a hard problem? Let's just find a, a reef basis for each of the, in the uh, intervals separately, right? So find a bunch of lambda k's so that we get a reef basis of exponentials for L2 of ik, and then just union all those uh, sets together then we would get a, a reef basis for L2 of the union of the intervals. And uh, so there are, uh, it's easy to find examples where this doesn't work. You can just say, well, this, this doesn't work. And it's true that it doesn't, but uh, we, want, we wanted to uh, look into that a little bit. Um, so sometimes it does work. So here's sort of a, an obvious uh, example. Uh, so we look at the interval zero one, and we just pick the um, odd, or sorry, the even frequency. So pick the even integers. Okay, the red dots here, and clearly this is an orthonormal basis for uh, L two of zero to one half. And if we choose the odd integers, that's a, a an uh, orthogonal basis for L two of one half to one. Uh, so the the reds form a a base for L2 of 0 to 1 half, the blues for L2 of 1 half to 1. And obviously, if we take their union, we get the, the classic orthonormal basis for L2 of, of 0, 1. So sometimes it works. And there's a trivial example where it works. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't work. And here's an example where it, it does not. Now, this example is uh, is the example that shows that the, the cottage, the, the one quarter in the cottage theorem is sharp. Um, but uh, but here's uh, here's how this classic example goes. So let's look at the uh, lambda one. So it's zero together with the um, even integers. Uh, positive integers are moved one quarter to the uh, to the left and the negative evens are moved one quarter to the right. So uh, in other words, we get this set here. And so since this is a perturbation by less than a half, the even integers is clearly forms an or, uh, these exponentials form a reef spaces for L2 of zero to one half by Cottage's theorem. Uh, and so we take, uh, we do the uh, same with the odd integers. Take the um, uh, positive ones, move them one, half, uh, one quarter rather to the left, negative ones move them one quarter to the right, so we're kind of taking the uh, integers and kind of smooshing them in by one quarter toward the origin. And this is clearly, again, by Cottage, this forms a reef basis for L2 of one half one. But the uh, union is not a reef basis for L2 of zero one. And what you can, in fact, show 
is that if you remove zero, then the uh, blue and the red dots together are complete in L2 of zero one. They do not form a, a basis, but they're complete, uh, which means that by adding zero, we now have an overcomplete set and the respaces cannot be uh, overcomplete. It's exact. So, uh, so here we have two respaces, union them together, and you do not get a respaces for the union. In fact, you get too many uh, um, points. Okay, so that uh, um, this leads to a couple of results. So, so there doesn't seem to be a lot about this that I could find in the literature. Uh, there are a few results in this direction. Uh, this uh, is this is a result of Abdonin. Uh, sorry, I don't. I did not neglected to write his name here, but this is due to Abdonin, uh, and it, it, uh, it refers to it as basis extraction. So suppose we take um, a set of real numbers whose exponentials form a Reese basis for L two of zero one. Then, given alpha between zero and one, I can extract uh, a subset of lambda, so lambda prime, so that E lambda prime is a Reese basis. For L2 of zero alpha. Uh, so, and that's true, that can always be done. So the question is, um, is it necessarily true that the remaining points, uh, so lambda take away lambda prime, form a respaces for L2 of alpha one, form a respaces for the rest of the interval? He also has a result. Abdonin in the, in the same section of the book, in the same book, about, uh, uh, which he calls basis complementation. So suppose that we start with a collection of real numbers whose exponentials form a Reese basis for L2 of zero alpha. Then we can extend this, extend this set to a larger set so that uh, the exponentials at lambda prime form a Reese basis for L2 of zero one. And again, is it necessarily true that um, the exponentials uh, that we added form a Reese basis for L2 of alpha one? So this is not addressed in the, in the paper, but in fact, the answer is no. Oops, sorry. And this, I think the, the title to this, I'm sorry, the title of this slide is maybe a uh, Gone away, but this is a um, uh, an example due to Daeguan Li, who's um, Gertz's um, uh, one of his postdocs. Uh, this is a great example, so I really like it. So um, I believe his name is at the top of the slide, which I can't see at the moment. But um, uh, anyway, so uh, so so here's a good example where uh, you can extract a basis or complement a basis without. Um, uh, Without the the things you would like for the uh, for the extra um, you know for the leftover points. So okay, so if we take the uh, the negative even integers and the odd uh, positive integers shifted to the uh, to the right by one eighth. So in other words, this uh, this set here. Then this uh, this set is clearly a respaces for uh, L two of zero to one half because it is a perturbation of this lattice. The black dots by less than uh, one half, and one half is the constant that uh, the, 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 uh, that shows up in the cottage theorem for an interval of this length. So, so this is a perturbation of um, of a, a orthogonal basis for L two of zero to zero to one half. Okay. Um, now we uh, complement this um, uh, this set. By adding in the um, uh, the positive evens, uh, so so this is this is the original set that we had. Okay, so so these stay right. This stays. We're adding in the uh, the positive even numbers and the um, negative odd numbers shifted now to the left by one eighth. In other words, we get so that's our original. There's our um, uh, our extras are we complement the interval this way, and uh, and what we have is that uh, uh, lambda naught is a respaces for L two of zero one. So we've successfully complemented this set. 
into a Reef basis for L2 of 0, 1. And that's clearly true because this is a small perturbation of the integers. And of course, there's nothing magical about 1 8. This can be a small number as small as you like. So it's an arbitrarily small perturbation of the integers. Okay. So um, let's look at uh, what remains. Okay. So this is the, uh, uh, the extra points that we added. Okay, if we look at, if we append zero to these uh, these points, okay, what do we get? We get um, uh, these blue points together with uh, zero here. And uh, this set is not a Reese basis for, uh, for L2 of one half to one because it is, uh, together with zero, it's a, it's a perturbation of, of this shifted lattice by less than one half. So uh, the only tool we're using here is the cottage one quarter theorem, and uh, we can get an example where you can neither um, you you where where if you complement lambda in this particular way, the leftover is not a Reese basis, and if you were to extract lambda from lambda zero here, then uh, you would also not get your leftovers would not form a Reese basis for the remaining interval. I really like. I think this is a really a neat result or neat uh, example, um, but uh, but it shows that it doesn't it doesn't necessarily work. Okay, now there is a, a result of Lubarsky and Seip that uh, that does address this and shows that extraction is always possible. Okay, and here's the result: if I have a re basis for L2 of zero one, and I choose A between zero and one, then I can split lambda into disjoint sets. Uh, so that each of these uh, sets of exponentials is a Reese basis for its corresponding interval. So this, so it, it can be done. It is always possible to extract a basis in the in the right way. Okay, uh, and and final uh, bit of background before I get to the main result. If um, if this, if a collection of exponentials is an orthogonal basis, then extraction and complementation always go together and always um, complement. And if, if you can extract, if you can always complement. Okay, and this is a theorem that um, appears in uh, Mayer and, and uh, Mate's paper on um, uh, um, uh, from 2009 on um, compressive sensing. Uh, they state the result without proving it, and, uh, and these folks here in a paper in 2016 uh, related to unions of, of re species actually provide a proof of this result, and it's not, um, uh, uh, yeah, they, 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 they include a proof of this result in, in their paper. Uh, so it says the following, it, take any subset of zero, one, and suppose that we uh, find a subset of Z such that E, e lambda is a re basis for L2 of S, then E, Z, take away lambda is a re basis for L2 of 0, 1, take away S. And the, the orthogonality uh, appears to be essential in that proof. So that's kind of interesting um, that uh, De Guan's example uh, is an arbitrarily small perturbation from, a, uh, from um, an orthogonal basis. So it seems that... Uh, that orthogonality in this result is, uh, is essential. So, um, okay. So now about the about the main results. So what we try to do is um, uh, is partition uh, the integers uh, for arbitrarily many intervals. Okay. So one a version of the result is the following. So if we're given a partition of zero one, then there exists a corresponding partition of z into sets lambda one through lambda n such that E lambda K is a Reese basis for L2 of each of these, uh, you know, the Kth interval here. Uh, and in addition, we can take the union of these um, exponential bases, bases in such a way that the union of the bases is a Reese basis for the union of the intervals. Okay, so in this version of the uh, results, we, let's say we, um, uh, you know, partition zero one in this way, so uh, the sizes are irrelevant of these of these intervals, and um, we can partition the integers 
so that in the lambda one through lambda five, so that we get respaces for each one of these subintervals. Uh, then we can join together uh, um, these respaces uh, and correspondingly join together the intervals and still have a, uh, a respaces. Okay, now this is not the um, uh, um, the most general result because if you remember, the point really is not about what these intervals actually are, but the length of these intervals. So this is sort of a proto uh, result that we can actually do this. Uh, a result of for which the previous one is corollary is the following. Suppose we just choose um, length. So we think of these B1, these B sub J's as interval lengths. And suppose that the lengths add up to one, then we can do the same. We can um, <coughs> partition the, inter the integers into n subsets, uh, and then uh, choose any uh, subset of these um, uh, of, of one through n, and then join up um, the these interval lengths, and and, uh, and show that the um, uh, the union of these uh, sets of exponentials is a respaces for any interval that has uh, length, the union of the corresponding BJs. Okay, so that means that we don't, there's nothing, there's no reason to, uh, to have to choose contiguous sets to take unions of. So in other words, if this is our um, um, partition as before, we just, our Bs are just the lengths of these intervals, so I could choose, for example, you know, lambda two, lambda four, and lambda five, and join them together, and I would get a respace for any interval of this length. Okay. And there's nothing preventing us from doing this for inf for infinite partitions. Okay, there is a, um, a limitation here. So I can take a uh, infinite uh, you know an infinite number of lengths that add to one okay and i can uh also find uh an infinite number of pairwise disjoints uh subsets of z they do not necessarily uh partition z okay but they're all disjoint sets so that um i can do what i did before with uh any uh subset of these lengths these bjs as long as I choose a K beforehand and uh, and the number of these intervals is less than or equal to K. So it's true for any K, but the K has to be chosen beforehand. So I can take any, you know, any um, uh, infinite partition of zero, one. Okay, so, uh, so like I said, the remainder of the talk will be, we'll talk about the proof of this result and how we use these um, results, you know, Abdonan, uh, Beatty Frankel, and uh, Bail Kinchin to, uh, to prove them. So this is the uh, the main result of Abdonan, and this is the real um, powerful lever that that, uh, that gives that allows us to do this construction. Uh, but so we're stating it in in, uh, in our particular way. But uh, it says the following: If I have a mapping from this shifted and dilated uh, version of the integers into R, which is injective and whose range is separated, then the exponentials concentrated on the, you know, the frequencies are on the range of C. There's a respace is for L2 of 0A if there exists um, an R bigger than zero such that, uh, such that this holds. So uh, as you can see, this is like uh, the cottage one quarter theorem, except that it says that if on average the uh, perturbation of uh, of the lattice, this uh, uh, phi of k plus alpha over a, if the perturbation of that lattice is on average close to the lattice, okay, in this sense, then uh, it's also a respace. So it's a very powerful result. This is uh, uh, remarkable, actually. Okay, and again, the, it's the length of the interval that matters, right? It's not necessarily this interval, but any interval of length A. Okay. So of course, this uh, this statement is not the most general statement of the theorem. It's for um, you know 
arbitrary uh, uh, respaces, right? Not um, uh, respaces of exponentials. I mean, not just uh, on shifted and dilated uh, integer lattices. Okay, but this is uh, this is good enough for what uh, for what we want to do. Okay. Um, right. So uh, so uh, given Abdonin's theorem, we define what we call an Abdonin map. So given epsilon and a, uh, epsilon a and alpha, a is positive. So uh, we an, an injective map from z plus alpha over a to r with a separated range is called an epsilon Abdonin map for z plus alpha over a. If for all r bigger than zero, sufficiently large, this um, inequality holds. So this is uh, inequality from Abdonin's theorem with epsilon here on the on the right hand side. And so uh, if phi is an epsilon Abdonin map for z plus alpha over a with epsilon less than or equal to one fourth, then exponentials on the range of phi form a respaces of exponentials for L2 of i, any interval of length a. Okay. All right, so, so now with uh, uh, one interval, okay, we're ready to, uh, to uh, do the proof for one interval, and this is not a new result. Um, our first goal is to prove the following theorem. So given um, a between zero and one, there's just a subset of the integers such that E uh, lambda is a respace basis for L2 of zero A. So clearly this was uh, known to have done in because, uh, because of the basis extraction result. Syph also, Used Abdonin's theorem to prove this in the context of um, trying to solve the problem of finding a respace of exponentials for union of intervals. Um, but uh, but this proof is going to be slightly different from what they did, or different from what they did. So um, so let's assume A is irrational. That's that's the interesting case. Uh, so what we do is we we know that this set. Is a Reese basis for L2 of 0a, right? Okay, so we're shifting by one half in this case, so alpha is a half. But we know that um, exponentials on gamma are Reese basis for uh, L2 of 0a. And so, uh, so all we do is we take each element of gamma and round it to the nearest element of z plus one half. And of course, uh, you know, if we can find a Reese basis. As a subset of z plus one half, then we found a respaces uh, as a subset of z. So we just round to the nearest element of z plus one half, which involves just taking the, the floor function of x, meaning the uh, the greatest integer function. So this is the greatest integer less than or equal to x, and adding one half. This is uh, this rounding map that takes every any x to the to uh, the element of z plus one half that's closest to it. Of course, there's ambiguity, but um, we're not going to worry about that because this won't happen in our uh, example. Okay. So, um, yes. So, for example, okay, if we uh, take the interval 0, 1, and then set A to be 1 over root 2, right? Our um, z plus 1 half over A is, is this shifted lattice. Okay, and if I, if I put the integers down here, I'm, um, they're all shifted by half, right? And uh, here's uh, the points in this lattice, okay? And uh, what do I know? So I want to round each of these to the closest element of uh, z plus one half over a, right? And I get these points. Okay, so how do I know these points form a, uh, exponential that these points form a respaces. Well, for that, I use the uh, equidistribution theorem, the Vale Kinchin equidistribution theorem. And uh, so if I find the average perturbation, I think you can sort of see what's coming here. Okay, the, the equidistribution theorem is uh, usually written as follows that uh, if I take uh, multiples of an irrational number, mod one, that these will be equidistribution. Uh, equidistributed in the interval zero one. Okay, so in other words, this is uh, this is the case of the average um, leftover is uh, converges to one half. 
That's not quite exactly what we want, but it's easy enough to put this in the correct form to use uh, a Donan's theorem. So we uh, modify this slightly to the uh, Vail Kinchin uh, version. Okay. Uh, the fact that um, we can fix R and then take intervals of length R, you know, of, of integers, is um, uh, is useful. Okay. But this is a uh, uh, a modified version of the of the extra distribution theorem, and uh, if we note right, just by rewriting k plus one half over a mod one in this form, it's the the point minus its um, uh, uh, its floor function. Then uh, then we see that that we basically have shown that this mapping is a an epsilon of Donan map for every epsilon bigger than zero. Okay. So, um, so that's uh, that's the result. Right? That this map is uh, an epsilon of donut of donut map for every epsilon bigger than zero. Okay, so it's automatically for for all epsilons you just change the r, but um, it's an epsilon of donut map for every epsilon. So if we take epsilon small enough, we get the uh, the result for uh, for one interval. Okay, so um, so let's now look at two intervals. Okay, so do we get complementation? Okay, well, okay, so here's our first uh, setup. Okay, now let's look at, at the remaining uh, bit of zero, one, and the corresponding uh, mapping here, z plus one half uh, over b, like this. And so here's uh here's the, the um so the blue dots form a uh, an orthogonal basis here. And so what if we then go and just round these blue dots to the nearest element of z plus one half? And that's what we get. Okay. So here's where uh it'd be nice if there were if I could see people, because uh I usually ask the question, is anyone anyone surprised by that? At least I've, I've gotten some raised eyebrows. Okay, surprised by what? Well, surprised by the fact that these blue dots drop right into the gaps left by the red dots. And is that just uh, an anomaly of, uh, of you know the, the drawing that I made here? Well, it isn't actually. That always happens. Okay, and that is um, some that is a theorem due to Beatty. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about this, and it's a very elementary theorem, but it's um, something that uh, I, I guess maybe the minority of mathematicians really are familiar with. I wasn't, to say much, but uh, 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 but this is the theorem, okay, of Beatty. So if we take irrational numbers that add to one, and look at the following set. So I, I take um, uh, k over a, so the integer lattice. Uh, dilated so that the distance between uh, consecutive points is 1 over a, do the same for b. Uh, these two sets partition the natural numbers. So here I'm restricting k to be uh, uh, to the natural numbers. They partition the natural numbers. And of course, this can easily be um, generalized to partition the integers. Okay, but uh, the proof is actually very uh, simple. And here it is, the whole thing is right here. Okay. I will let you uh, read it if you like, uh, but um, this is it right here. And the uh, the only thing that I want to point out is that uh, the conclusion of the theorem talks about partitioning the natural numbers, but really we we're partitioning any subinterval of the form zero to to n. Okay, so in that sense, it's sort of a local partitioning result. We can, you know. It's not that surprising, but you can uh, see that uh, for any natural number, we can partition the interval zero to n, um, and then it sort of join those all together to get a partition of natural numbers. Okay. Yeah. So this is a. Uh, I'll leave that up to count of five, and then we'll have the proof. So where did this come from? So this was a, a solution to a problem that was. Uh, posed in the uh, Mathematical Monthly in 1926, but um, apparently these kind of sequences were uh, known and mentioned 
uh, going back in the 19th century by Lord uh, Rayleigh in relation to the study of sound waves. So there's a lot to these um, uh, these Beatty sequences. If you Google it, you can find a very nice talk uh, about this um, from someone at uh, Virginia Tech. I should know the name, but I forget. Anyway, um, uh, so, so this was a solution to a problem in the monthly. In uh, um, Frankel, in the late 60s, he uh, considered sequences of this form, so affine sequences that are um, uh, you know, rounded to their floor, for these inhomogeneous Beatty sequences. And uh, it's his result that we need, and that's basically the, uh, uh, the correct result, that you can actually shift a lattice and still partition Z. Okay. Okay, so combining uh, Beatty Frankel and Vale Kinchin, we can uh, say the following. Okay, and this is uh, um, basically the same result that I uh, put up before. So given A, A, B bigger than zero, we can define maps, you know, injective maps from this lattice, so, you know, between these lattices from Z plus a half over A. To z plus one half over a plus b, and the same for this lattice, okay, in such a way that the range of these maps partitions z plus one half over a plus b, and in such a way that phi and psi are epsilon of donut maps for every epsilon bigger than zero. Okay, so this immediately gives us our um, complementation, okay. Uh, but uh, anyway, here, here's the, the way the, the proof goes. It's uh, um, just run through it kind of quickly. So Beatty Frankel gives us the, um, uh, you know, we use these rounding maps. Beatty Frankel gives us the uh, partition part. Okay, and Vale Kinchin gives us the uh, epsilon of Donin part. Okay, so by choosing our capital R in the definition of, of Donin maps large enough, we can get these to be epsilon of Donin maps for any epsilon bigger than zero. Okay, so um, so that's for, for two intervals. Okay, so we can always do this, partition the integers in such a way that we get um, extraction and complementation for two intervals. But what about three intervals? Um, well, here's, uh, it gets, uh, I think, rather interesting here. So we're going to take the situation from before and divide zero to one over root two in two. And this one's nice and rational, so. Um, all these and understand. So we have our this partition into three of zero one. Um, there is uh, our lattice for um, the green interval, and these are green points. So this is an, uh, for, for orthogonal basis. Okay, we have the red points as before. Okay, and um, what I'm going to do is um, yeah, and here are the sorry, here are the blue points. Okay. So what we want to do is do something similar to what we did before and um, partition the integers or z plus one half from these three intervals in such a way that the perturbation is small, stays small. Um, so you might ask, okay, well, can you just round off? And if you just look at the illustration here, you see that you can't, uh, it doesn't work. Um, so for example, uh, let's see if I can find one, you can find one. Here we go, so this red and this blue, right? If I round them, they're of course clearly gonna go to the same one, okay? And nobody's gonna go to nine here. So two people go to eight, nobody goes to nine. So it just doesn't work. And in fact, there's a, um, uh, a paper um, that's referenced in the, in the Beatty Frankel paper that, that proves that this never works. Okay, you will never get a partition with more than two intervals. I mean, more than two lattices. I mean. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, do something um, kind of like, um, uh, you know, something inductive, and say, well, okay, so I know that I can partition this black interval into two, right? So there we go. So here's the um, um, uh, the uh, the lattice, right? This lattice, z plus one half over b one plus b two, that forms an uh, orthogonal basis for 
L2 of this interval, of the black interval. Okay, and I also know that I can, if I round off the, um, oh, well, here I am, I'm sorry, I'm going out of order. Here I am rounding off the blue down here, okay? Uh, but in the meantime, I will first round off these, uh, the green and the red points to this lattice. Okay, so now I have uh, this lattice, uh, you know, this black one and the blue one, Okay, and I and I know from Beatty Frankel that if I round these um, black dots, I can partition the interval, right, or rather partition the integers. Okay, great. So uh, I can do that. I, I can form the partition. But uh, what about Abdonin's theorem? And here, you know, we can look a little more carefully at the illustration and see what the problem is. Uh, so where does this, um, so let's see, let, let's look at, at the green points, okay? And ask ourselves, where do they, where do they map, okay? Well, most of them map to uh, where they would have gone anyway, okay? But this one here, you can see it's, it sort of maps over to the left, okay? Uh, and if I were to keep going, okay, what would have to happen is that as many times as the green one moves to the left, it would have to move to the right in order to balance that out, okay? And we can notice here, if we look at these red points, okay, we notice that uh, here, this red point would naturally go here, or just rounding, but it doesn't, it goes to the right. Okay, this one goes where it should, this one goes where it should, however, this one, eventually goes to the right. This one also eventually goes to the right. Okay, so it seems to be, at least in this picture, an imbalance in where the red points ultimately get shifted to. And what we want in order to use Abdonin's theorem, we want shifts in one direction to be balanced out by shifts in the other direction. And so maybe that'll happen. There's only, you know, 24 numbers here, but uh, we have no idea. So uh, it might be necessary to rearrange some of these points so that we still get a partition, but such that Abdonin's theorem is satisfied. And that's uh, what this is meant to illustrate. So if, if uh, our greens are going a little too far to the left on average, the reds a little too far to the right on average, maybe we occasionally have to uh, exchange a couple to get the thing to work. Okay. Uh, so by working inductively, we can, uh, so this is just what was illustrated before, we can partition Z into three sets. However, we do not know if the um, resulting partition satisfies Abdonin's theorem. So we need to deploy a calculus of Abdonin maps. And this is the, uh, the main result or the lemma that, uh, that we use. So suppose we have two uh, Abdonin maps, okay, just like we created before. They partition Z plus one half over B1 plus B2. And suppose we have a third map that takes this lattice to Z plus one half. So um, this would be the, uh, so this, these would be the first two rounding maps with the green and the um, red dots. And this would be the rounding map with the blue dots or the general rounding map, okay? So, um, Suppose that this is true and that these guys are Abdonin maps. Okay, these, there should be hats here, I apologize, it's a typo. These, these guys are Abdonin maps. And if uh, sigma is also an Abdonin map, so these are delta, and th that, this one's an epsilon Abdonin maps, then we can locally modify, locally meaning we can do it on uh, finite intervals, just like the Beatty theorem. Uh, so we can modify uh, phi hat and psi hat to phi and psi so that uh, they still um, partition z plus one half over b1 plus b2 and such that these compositions are epsilon plus three delta donor maps. So we can uh, basically modify our uh, maps that don't quite work uh, into uh, abdonin maps to do as long as epsilon and delta are smaller. Okay, so so here's kind of how it goes for three uh, intervals. 
Okay, so we, we have B1, B2, B3 that add up to one. We start with uh, epsilon of donut maps, uh, phi one and psi one, like so. We know we can do this, okay? They partition uh, Z plus one half, and we get um, uh, three spaces for intervals of length B1 and also intervals of length B2 plus B3, okay? So this is the guy we like, and this guy we're gonna continue to work with. Okay, now, um, we can um, uh, define maps, right? These can be simple rounding maps uh, from Z plus one half over B2 and Z plus one half over B3 into onto this lattice, okay? Which are epsilon of, or uh, delta donut maps um, and partition this interval, okay? And by applying the lemma, we can adjust these maps in such a way that uh, these compositions, right, that go now from uh, z plus a half over b2 and z plus a half over b3 to z plus a half are epsilon plus three delta and donut maps. And, uh, and so we can partition gamma one into these two sets, okay? And by choosing epsilon and delta small enough, we get uh, these three. Um, uh, um, you know, we get that each of these sets of exponentials is a respaces for the interval of the correct length. And this is our desired partition. Okay. So I uh, almost finished. Okay. Uh, I'll go quickly and only take a couple of minutes. And I apologize, I'm more than 50 minutes long. Uh, so, um, so, here's how the, so here's how the theorem sort of plays out. Okay. And you can, uh, uh, it's not um, a big surprise. We just sort of, uh, you know, do our inductive proof and then, uh, um, you know, keep track of all the indices and things like that. So we start with a infinite partition of, uh, of of lengths that add to one. Okay, we form we form our maps. Okay, or no, I'm sorry. We um, uh, the theorem says that we can actually find uh, maps capital CJ and capital Psi J into, from these um, uh, lattices into Z plus one half, so that we get the uh, things partitioned in the right way, and that these maps are all one minus two to the minus J delta of donut map. So we fix the delta up here, and uh, we and these are essentially all delta of donut maps. We're slightly below delta here, okay? And how does it go? Well. Uh, I think you can um, guess. So we start with these uh, padded maps, <laughs> which can be simple rounding maps. Okay, we pick our epsilons in this clever way, uh, and we adjust. Okay, for j equals one, we just don't adjust. We just take the rounding maps. For j equals two, we adjust. Okay, and uh, epsilon plus three delta, or epsilon one plus three epsilon two, give us this. And then we just can proceed inductively um, like so. And we can prove the theorem. So we get these, uh, um, so we can partition, not partition, but we can uh, find disjoint sets going infinitely far down. We can go down as far as we want. Okay. And get an infinite number of lambda k's that will give us uh, the, um, the result. Now, uh, but that's not the theorem we proved. We wanted to prove that we can actually join these intervals together. And get uh, abdomen maps. So this is a um, uh, the result that lets us do that. Okay, we can take two epsilon abdomen maps, and uh, we can define a third map that uh, whose whose uh, range is the same. You know, it's the union of these two maps, and which uh, is a four four epsilon abdomen map. Okay, so this. Uh, so finally, with the uh, the last theorem. Okay, um, we choose a K, we take our partition, you know, our lengths, we choose a K, we use our uh, first theorem to, to, uh, to find these disjoint subsets of Z that give us exponential bases for each subinterval, okay? And then we choose a, um, a subset of the natural numbers that contains no more than K elements, 
okay? And, uh, and what do we do? We take uh, the corresponding intervals of length bj, and we join them together using the previous one. So uh, we take delta to be four to the minus k. We um, uh, compute these four to the minus k of donut maps. They're actually one minus two to the minus j times four to the minus k of donut maps. But we don't need that, okay? And then um, we take these uh, lambda j's to be the ranges of these uh, tj's. And, uh, and then we start uh, joining them together, okay, using the lemma. And the lemma, we only applied k minus one times, not k times. We end up with a one quarter of donut map, okay? Piece of j, j is a subset. Okay, and hence we can, um, uh, we get the result. And the, uh, the, the re reason that we can't just say any finite subset rather than specifying k beforehand is that, um, in the uh, in the lemma that where we join things together, the uh, abdominal constants uh, build up too quickly. So uh, that is also that's the proof of this uh, of this theorem. And I uh, thank you very much for your time.